Hello, my dear lovely students. Welcome to this wonderful session where I'll be discussing your previous year questions, your 2019 questions for your CBSE examination. You know CBSE examination, your board examination around the corner and we are preparing very hard for that. That's why we have started this series where we are discussing your previous year questions because always practice makes a man perfect so it's always good to practice questions. <coughs> Now in today's session, we are discussing 2019 paper. Uh, whatever questions which were asked from the zoology part, that I am going to discuss today. And if you feel any doubt related to any topic, you can comment in the comment section. And definitely the series will go on till you attain your target of getting more than 95% uh, uh, marks in your examination. So let's start the session. You know I am your chubby ma'am. So let's not waste any time and let's start this session and let's see what kind of questions were asked in this examination, 2019 examination. So first I'll be dealing with a very short answer type question. So very short answer type questions. So guys, whenever we have this a very short answer type question, always be clear that you have to give answers either in a one line or a one word. Do not waste your time in these questions because they are just of one marks and they are very scoring also. Because uh, it is, uh, uh, unlike that of five marks question where you have to write stories, where you have to write so many things about a question, here just one line is enough. So focus on that question, they are very important, first thing. If you are right, definitely you will get one marks. If you are wrong, you will not get that one mark. But for the five marks, sometimes it is like teacher will give you 3.5 marks or the four marks, depending on how much you write or how accurately you write a particular topic. But here, these questions, they are very scoring. So carefully attempt them. So it is always my preference. So I always recommend this to my students. That whenever you are doing such questions, always start, whenever you are doing any paper, or biology paper, always start with a one mark question because they are very scoring. You will definitely get one mark out of it. Later on, at the end, you should attempt a five marks question because sometimes when we start paper, we start with a long answer question and we keep on writing. We keep on writing and writing and writing and that wastes a lot of time. So for the two hours, many times I have seen those students also, they have shared that incident that whenever they start with the long answer type question for the two hours, he, he started, he was continuously writing those, those long answer type question and after that one hour was left in that one hour he <coughs> focused on the very short and the short answer type question and this sh we should not do this, clear? Okay. The first question, that was the one mark which was asked in this paper was, state the two principal outcomes of the experiments conducted by the Lewis Pasteur on the origin of life. You all know about the experiment which was conducted by the Lewis Pasteur, yes or no? Hope my students know about it. So Lewis Pasteur did this experiment where he told that life, uh, life come from pre-existing life. So what did he say? He said, life comes from pre-existing life, pre-existing life. He said that when the broth was completely sterilized, he said when broth, the culture broth, when it was sterilized, sterilized and very important, very important guys. And the neck was closed. Neck was closed. A by any means if it is closed, that means either by the water vapor, if anything if it is closed, then no life was seen. No life seen. Clear? Now, in the second way, when the culture broke, that was sterilized, that was sterilized, but neck was open, that means it was open from outside, by any means, suppose the water vapors are not there, by any means, of it is of no, <coughs> <coughs> it was not S shaped, in that case life appear. So that means the life was there in this case, but in another one, the life was not there, right? So that means life somewhere or other came from environment. Some spores, they were present in the environment and from the environment, those spores, they enter into the broth. So he gave the statement that life comes from pre-existing life. 
he was totally against that idea that life come from the non living material he was totally against it and that's the reason he conducted this experiment clear his experiment was very interesting <coughs> <coughs> and he gave the pasteurization rule also that we all know today very important the reason why we keep on boiling our milk now moving on to the next we have is a no, if in for the short answer type question only one question came from the zoology part and now let's move on to the short answer type question but it doesn't mean that the overall weightage of zoology was less no zoology and botany have they have equal weightage equal weightage is there as far as your biology exam is considered sometime uh, short answer type they are very less and uh, the long answer type they are more so this, this is how they balance them now moving on to the next is what would be the gene flow the genetic drift affect how would the gene flow or the genetic drift affect the population in which either of them happens to take place now listen very carefully each and every population whenever we are talking about any population any population they tend to remain in one kind of equilibrium which is termed as hardy weinblatt equilibrium they tend to remain in hardy weinberg equilibrium every population they tend to remain in hardy weinberg equilibrium so what do you mean by hardy weinberg equilibrium guys hardy weinberg equilibrium states that gene frequency tend to remain constant gene frequency remain constant they tend to they always tend to remain constant but 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 one problem definitely exists that is some external force if some force act on a population <coughs> <coughs> suppose some force is acting on this population some force right these forces can be any for example these forces can be migration that means people they are moving in and moving out of the country definitely it is going to affect the gene frequency and suppose the drift is happening the genetic drift is happening sudden change is happening sudden change because of genetic drift if founder effect is happening founder's effect is happening anything which is happening definitely it is going to affect this population and the hardy weinberg equilibrium the which says the gene frequency tends to remain constant that p plus q is equal to 1 or p square plus q square plus 2 pq is equal to 1 it will not be one any more it will be affected see listen to this very carefully i'll take an example and i'll tell you now do not write this in your paper this is just for your understanding guys suppose when we talk about gene frequency or say allelic frequency of tall allele is 0.6 right and when i say allele frequency for the dwarf very simple example i am taking that is 4 in a population so what will happen 0.6 plus 0.4 this is equal to 1 that means population is in hardy weinberg equilibrium suppose in that po this particular population some tall individuals they are coming lots and lots of tall individuals they are coming lots and lots of tall individuals they are coming guys then what will happen it will increase it will not come to, to 1 <coughs> that means p plus q this is a p this is a p this is q it will equal to 1 but once the migration will happen p plus q will not be equal to 1 yes yes it happens clear yeah. so this is a frequency or sometimes up a different kind of person they are coming right a uh, you can say mediocre kind of person they are coming or some uh anything uh, uh, is happening some moving out of the population emigration is happening that is also going to affect the hardy weinberg equilibrium clear okay now let's move on to the next question 
differentiate between the, see this type of question comes when we have a short answer or a long answer type question where we have a or option that means either you have to attempt a first one or the second one do not att attempt both of them or if you attempt both of them suppose by mistake you have attempted this one and this one also in that case the first one will be considered the teacher uh, will check the first one they will ignore the second one so be careful while attempting such questions so those which you know that this is important and this you know about it this you can write in a better way just focus on them otherwise do not otherwise you can ignore you can take the other or part now differentiate between the roles of b lymphocytes and the t lymphocytes in generating immune response very easy question right let's talk about it let's 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 talk about it okay guys listen b lymphocytes lymphocytes now the first thing you have to understand is b lymphocytes they are formed where are they formed they are formed in bone marrow they are formed in bone marrow clear what about the maturation what about the maturation yes that also happens in bone marrow the difference you have to write the t lymphocyte they are formed where where are they formed they are formed in bone marrow right and maturation when we talk about maturation where does this maturation happen their maturation happen in the thymus right let's move on to the second point this is the first point this is the second point t lymphocytes they are responsible for the production of antibiotics oh sorry antibodies <laughs> produce anti bodies clear on the contrary the t lymphocyte what do they do they help b cells in production of anti bodies so they basically help guys clear now the next one next one third one third difference is that they are responsible for which type of immune response the humoral immune response right what is another name of humoral immune response that is antibody is mediated immunity clear on the contrary this one the third one this uh, the third difference over here that they are responsible for for cell mediated immune response or immunity clear clear guys hope till now the things are clear now basically when we talk about the b cells b cells they are of two type the plasma b, b cells and the memory b cells clear i'll write about it just one second so here the fourth point is we have is a b cell they further differentiate into the plasma b cells plasma b cells and the the memory b cells memory b cells 
So we all know that the plasma B cells are those cells which helps in the formation of antibodies. So they form antibodies. Whereas they helps in memory. So memory here, guys, means that means for the recognition. That means uh, whenever a, the, a particular pathogen comes for the second time, the attack will be more faster. So whereas this one, the T cells, the T lymphocyte, it's of further various type. T cytotoxic, T helper, T memory cell. Cytotoxic helps in killing. T cells, B T helper cells he helps the B cell in the production of antibodies and the memory cell will help in the recognition. So these are the certain points which, which you can remember because this is just a two marks question. So no need to write four points. The two right points, they are enough. Two each of these, like two for this and two for this. This is two. Otherwise, some pe whenever I talk about this in examination, uh, or, or to my student, they say, ma'am, two points, okay, one point this and one point this. No, this is not, like teacher will not be able to give you a uh, whole two marks when you will write only a one point difference. Better to write at least two point difference and if you know more about it, three points, that is very good. But do not go beyond three points. This is just for your reference because we are practicing things. So definitely it's always good to practice more. Okay, in the previous one, there were two parts. Principle of vaccination is based on the property of memory of the immune system. Taking one suitable example, justify the statement. Very easy. Now, <coughs> <coughs> now guys, whenever we talk about vaccination, vaccination, in case of vaccination, we, basically, it is based on the active artificial immunity artificial immunity right now in this what do we do in the vaccination procedure what actually is done is guys pathogen pathogen sometime whole listen whole part of surface antigen antigen or heat killed just a second or more dna that means any genetic material genetic material right they are introduced into the host body these things pathogen whole part or the dna yeah now whole pathogen here the pathogen that will be heat killed or that will be attenuated that means that is not causing that will not that is not able to cause disease but they will just act, act as an antigen that they will uh, evoke the immune system so these are introduced into the host body host body they are introduced into the host body what will our host body do host body is going to create antibodies against it Along with the production of antibody, they are going to create the memory cells. Right? Now, antibodies definitely they are going to work against this pathogen and they will kill this pathogen. Because they are non-pathogenic right now. They will not cause any disease. So, they are not of harm to us. They will just initiate an immune response in our body. The one which is important is this memory cells. Now these memory cells, they will recognize this pathogen. Now they will say, if you will come again, my overall action will be much, much, much faster than yours, uh, th than the first uh, response. Okay, so this is important, this may be. So today we have created so many types of vaccines, like we have oral polio vaccines with us, you know, oral polio drops, you can take an example of that, you can explain it, you can take an example of hepatitis B, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I'm not well today, guys, hope you can understand, your chubby mom is not well, 
I have some throat issues. Uh, um, right, other than you can take an hepatitis B vaccine, recombinant vaccine, a very good example. Uh, 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 so many vaccines, guys. We have, a, we have a vaccines for measles, we have vaccines for mumps. So many vaccines. And if you remember your childhood, your childhood was full of vaccination, where, you, where one after another, one, uh, these vaccines, they are being given. So they are same. Yeah. So this is vaccination. Oh, we can explain this by yourself. If you have any doubt related to this topic, any uh, in detail, if you want any uh, discussion, definitely we'll talk about it. Okay, guys. Okay, dokie. Clear? Because this is just a paper discussion, so I'm not going into detail. Sorry for that. But if you want a detailed discussion, we will. We can do that. Okay, this is also done. Now, another very important question from the two marks. See, this is how the question can be asked. Any form, they just took, they took one topic and they're just uh, roaming around the topic. They can ask any type of question, so get ready. How is continuous culture maintained in bioreactors and why? You know, this line, continuous and discontinuous, is already there in your NCRT. I'll talk about it, wait. Guys, when we talk about culturing, culturing, you remember? Guys, this topic is from the uh, chapter Biotechnology Application, uh, Biotechnology Principle and Processes. So, in the culturing, what do we do? We take recombinant cells, we take recombinant cells, right? And what do we do? We culture them. We culture them. Why do we culture them? Because what do we want is product, our desired product. We being very mean, so we need that product. So for this product, we are culturing a group of microorganisms, <coughs> <coughs> not a group, a particular type of microorganism in a sterile condition. Yeah. In a sterile condition, we culture it so that no other microbe, in fact, our specific cell should form. A copies of those cells they should form. Now, culture, this can be done in two different ways. Let's talk about it. The first type is a batch fermentation. Batch fermentation. So, what do you mean by batch fermentation, guys? So batch fermentation, guys, means you. We all make dal, uh, any kind of pulse in our pressure cooker. So what do we have? Is guys, we have a sorry for the bad drawing. We have a pressure cooker like this, right? Some other it look like this. And suppose this pressure coo cooker capacity is just two liter, and you have to make a uh, a pulse of around five liter. What will you do? You will first cook this two liter dal, right? Then you will empty this particular uh, vessel. Then you are going to put again 2 liter. And then again you are going to make a 1 liter. So this is like 2 liter plus 2 liter plus 1 liter. So with this you can make a total 5 liter of food you want. Clear? So this is termed as a batch fermentation where you have maintained a condition. You have created a tarka. You have done everything. You have closed that vessel. And you will open that vessel only when whole fermentation has been done. That is a batch fermentation. Now suppose another we have is continuous fermentation. Continuous fermentation. What do you mean by continuous fermentation, guys? Now suppose again. I have a very intelligent mechanism. Like I have this cooker, a pressure cooker. Sorry for the bad drawing again, guys. This I suppose hope it looked like a cooker. Now I have this pressure cooker and I need to cook a 5 liter of a food. 5 liter of a particular thing or a porridge or whatever I am making. So 5 liter I have to make. Then what I am going to use my mind, what I am going to do is, I am going to insert fresh uncooked thing from outside and those which are cooked I'll create a pour I'll create a tap here and I'm going to collect the cooked one from here and here the light of the fire is on the fire is on from the above we are adding more and more culture medium and from the lower side we are taking out the cooked one 
so this is termed as a continuous so that means continuously we are making it now question is because we are continuously opening this vessel so chances of <coughs> uh, chances of uh, contamination is very high so question is how is continuous culture meant uh, culture system maintained in bioreactor here particular temperature is being given sterile condition they are made and the ph is also regulated so chances of uh, of uh, uh, growth of various other microorganism non target organism that is very 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 less clear here also ph we do maintain the temperature also maintain the sterile condition we maintain everything clear is it clear so hope this mechanism of making a porridge making a dal or whatever is clear to you do not give example of a dal in your examination please don't do that this is for your explanation this is for my explanation this is for your understanding clear okay let's move on to the next question list any four ways by which gmos have been useful for enhanced crop output guys this question i am telling you this question is directly from your ncert in your ncert this is a first topic um uh, for biotechnology application the chapter biotechnology application this is the first topic that why are we creating genetically, genetically modified crops oh, why 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 see with the help of today with the help of recombinant dna technology recombinant dna technology we have created crops which are we all know insect resistant we have created insect resistant crops we have created insect resistant crops second important thing high yielding crops high yielding crops now today we have those crops with us whose overall yield is very 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 high second thing is the uh, sorry the third thing is more absorption of nutrients from soil we have created those plants who absorb more and more nutrients from the soil isn't it great that means more they are going to accumulate in the plant more we are going to consume it isn't it great so third thing is we are fourth thing is nutritional value we are going we have increased the nutritional value today we have all oh, oh. <laughs> uh you know the golden rice available with us vitamin a1 do you remember so that's the example you can take drought resistant crops we have created drought resistant crop isn't it great isn't it amazing so these are the points you can write as far as your recombinant dna technology which gives us the genetically modified crops they are considered isn't it amazing isn't it great so that means you are eating one crop and you are getting all the nutrient out of it the plant is high yielding you remember today we have those uh, <coughs> papaya plants with us whose height is very small but they give fruits high yielding insect resistant we know we have created bt cotton bt brinjal bt potato bt tomato with us which we we are which are resistant to lepidopteran coleopterans and dipterans more absorption they can absorb more and more nutrient from the soil isn't it great they are resistant to uh, drought like any uh, abiotic stress like if there is a stress of a water water uh, is very less so we have created such crops and all thanks to biotechnology okay now moving on to the next is short answer type questions type 2 they are of 3 marks so answer accordingly draw a label diagram to show it the relationship of four accessories duct in human male reproductive system 
human male reproductive system. This is also directly from your NCRT, but it's okay. We are revising. So let's draw that diagram as well. So okay, okay, okay. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. I'm just drawing a one side diagram. Just making a rough diagram to make you understand the whole uh, different kinds of uh, uh, the uh, male reproductive uh, system, uh, the ducts. Basically, we are dealing with the ducts, so we are only talking about it. You know, these are the testes. So, in the testes, you all know that seminiferous tubules are present. So, here we have seminiferous tubules. Clear? Yeah, seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules, they pour their secretion into some ducts. This is the first duct. The name is Rete testis. Rete testis. Rete testis are going to pour their secretion into the vas efferentia. So this I am giving with another color. This is vas efferentia. This is duct number two. This is the duct number one. This is the duct number two. Let's talk about the third duct that is epididymis. So it further has three parts caput corda and corpus. Now it pours their secretion into vasa efferentia, sorry vasa deferens and later on it forms the ejaculatory duct. Ejaculatory duct, common duct from both sides. It has secretion from seminal vesicles. They have secretion from the prostate. They have secretion from the Cowper's gland. Cowper's gland, another name is bulbo-urethral gland. Bulbo-urethral gland. Clear buddies? So here they are just talking about and ultimately they have urethra here penis and urethra. Clear? So all these, di this diagram should be clear to you directly from your notes. Nothing ex extra from the NCRT I have discussed. Clear? Please draw this diagram once. I told you, you should have, you should practice these diagrams. One for this and one for the fallopian tubular diagram. If you remember that uh, mm, uh, female reproductive tract diagram. Uh, which has ovaries and the section of ovaries also. I guess that is there in this question. We'll be talking about that as well. Clear buddies? Okay. Now draw a sectional view of the human ovary showing the different stages of developing follicles, corpus luteum and ovulation. Okay. Let's talk about this also. <coughs> So germinal epithelium of ovary, it also has the same part like a cortex and medulla. So 
now let's talk about follicles so definitely some because it is uh, it will be richly supplied with the blood vessels also how the blood vessel they will be present now let's talk about the follicles you all know till puberty 42 uh, 60 to 80000 primary follicles they are present so these are i'll label this as primary follicles primary follicles so primary follicles these are the basically the primary oocyte and the primary oocytes they have a layer of follicular cells around them clear so they have a layer I uh, if i can draw i'll definitely draw so they have a layer of follicular cells around it so this in a white i'm making are some follicular cells clear now let's move on further here these forms the secondary follicles so secondary follicles they have more follicular cells around it i'll make them big three to five layers of follicular cells they have so that we call it as secondary follicles So basically teacher wants to know whether you know about the primary follicle or secondary follicle or not that's why they ask such questions so it should be clear to you so basically students they are your secondary follicles now moving on to the next they have some cells in these stages also who forms who has secondary oocyte and they have uh, further layers they have zona pellucida they have a, and they start developing antrum they have thecal layers also around it They have this theca layer, which will further differentiate also, guys, into theca externa and interna. So these are your tertiary follicle. And now I'm only making one diagram of a graphene follicle because of lack of space. So this is a secondary oocyte clear outside the secondary oocyte we have a layer of zona pellucida then we have some layers of your corona radiata corona radiata then they form a bridge like structure like this and outside we have is the two layers well, let's draw that in a red color they have theca externa and theca interna respectively yeah now I, I label this don't worry so this is the this outermost we have is theca externa theca externa beneath theca externa we have is theca interna interna then we have is this layer this is bridge like structure it forms the cumulus euphorus then we have this layer the another whitish layer that is your favorite our favorite corona radiata corona radiata layer then the zona pellucida i forgot the green one is your zp i am writing zp as a zona pellucida please elaborate i don't have space right now then we yeah i guess that is done i'll elaborate it's okay zona pellucida so zona pellucida is basically but uh, guys it's a acellular layer this was asked in one of the neat examination this is a acellular layer and it is made up of glycoprotein okay guys now what will happen now this graphene follicle let's label this as a graphene follicle this is your graphene follicle 
now this graphene follicle definitely it will burst open and uh, it will throw the secondary oocyte it has a secondary oocyte inside it has a secondary oocyte okay now it is going to throw everything outside not everything they will keep the some cells with us with uh, uh, it and it will release this uh, with a green layer so this will be a secondary oocyte they will release and this is termed as ovulation this process is termed as ovulation and whatever which is left behind this will look like this they will be termed as corpus luteum corpus luteum and then it forms the scar like structure which is corpus albicans corpus albicans you know it acts as a temporary endocrine gland because it releases hormone this is a temporary endocrine gland because it releases hormones like progesterone and estrogen clear so this is a diagram of the ovary so a well labeled diagram should be there do not use pen while drawing a diagram be gentle draw it slowly take your time and do it well let's move on to the next question write the difference between a homo erectus and homo habilis basically guys homo erectus they have a cranial capacity of around 900 cc and the homo habilis they have a capacity of around they had a capacity of around 800 uh, 650 to 800 cc this was capacity a uh, homo erectus is considered they were uh, carnivores and they used to eat meat whereas the homo habilis they were vegetarian depending on the dentition we got to know that they were vegetarian or the non vegetarian like these are the two differences hope you can write <coughs> now this is a arrange hope you can this arrange we have as a silurian will come first then we have as a carboniferous and then jurassic okay yeah? now very easy i guess this is now beekeeping practice is a good income generating industry write the difference point to be kept in mind for a successful beekeeping write the scientific name of the most common indian species used for the purpose we have as a apis indica uh, with us uh, which we uh, normally uh, cultivate see beekeeping yes it's a difficult industry because the problem is the sting normally they sting also so it is very difficult to rear but overall when we see the benefit when we see the economic value yes it has a lot each and every part of the each and every product from the beekeeping industry they are of great value they produce wax which is used for the production of various things like uh, uh, the candles they are used for the production of some creams also we use this other than that they produce they have a, they produce honey we all know about the importance of honey so they are a very important and various things we have to keep in mind is uh the first thing is we have to maintain the sterile condition we have to uh, 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 sterile condition here means many times the fungus also act on the whole area uh, the whole bee hive so that should not happen the second important thing is suppose we are doing a bee hive we are doing a bee culture we should always keep this thing in mind that uh this should be a place or this should the temperature we should maintain for a bee hive and uh, 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 uh basically the number of vessels also we have to increase because they multiply at a very fast rate you know bees they are very important as far as our whole biodiversity is considered nowadays people are moving towards the beekeeping earlier like now uh, this is all because this is a very profitable business clear yeah? so apis indica you can take one example okay now describe the formation of recombinant dna by the action of eco r1 uh now recombinant dna by the action of eco r1 guys listen now if we have a dna strand like this whose sequence is g a a t t c 5 prime to 3 prime here c t t a a g this is again a 5 prime 
this is a 3 prime now first thing is we with eco r1 suppose guys this is my gene of interest suppose this is our gene of interest right same i am going to take a plasmid also plasmid guys what i am going to do is i am going to treat both of them with the same enzyme which is e co r1 escherichia coli r1 this is an restriction enzyme now this restriction enzyme is going to cut like this here and like this here and here also they are going to create a same kind of cut guys in both the cases overhanging sequences will be there and these overhanging sequence considering because they are cut by the eco r1 in both the cases so definitely they will be complementary to each other with the help of use of this enzyme basically uh, it's a recombinant dna you have to make this diagram is already there in your ncrt with respect to the sequence ga ttc you have to explain now this sequence you have to show over here and the same sequence you have to show in a plasmid also i'll i'll make sure that it is there in the plasmid and rest the procedure you can proceed here g a a t t t c clear on the opposite strand because it will be a double stranded definitely so d a a t t c clear now same cut will happen like this like this now what will happen guys from here the two strands they will be created here there will be g and here will be c t t a a on the other hand we will be having another strand of a a t t c and then this strand and here there will be g and then this strand clear and when you cut our gene of interest with this enzyme here also guys we will be having this g and on the next strand we will be having c t t a a now here a a t t c and here also we will be having only g with us now guys listen to this now this strand this strand will readily found find this strand because they will be complementary to each other see they will be complementary to each other so in a mixture of these they will bind to each other later on they will be ligated so this is how the structure will look like it will be having somewhere or other structure like this and it has a some strand of our gene of interest our gene of interest will go our gene of interest will bind like this clear yeah? our gene of interest will bind like this okay and once it is bound like this that means it is our recombinant plasmid what do we call it we will call it recombinant plasmid now our recombinant plasmid is ready now what will happen what will we do the transformation we will introduce this recombinant plasmid recombinant plasmid into the plasmid free e coli let's say let's take this example of plasmid free e coli now we have this e coli and it only has a bacterial chromosome we are going to introduce and it has a foreign gene or a gene of interest which earlier i was showing in a red color so <coughs> introduction will happen and ultimately the cell will be having the bacterial chromosome this is a bacterial chromosome it will be having a plasmid with this one this is a recombinant cell recombinant cell now what we are going to do guys we are going to culture this in bioreactors 
bio reactors and then bio processing will be done that means extraction of our product can be done so is it clear this is a very easy procedure and this is already there in your ncert so i have not explained this in detail if you want me to explain this definitely we can also do that okay let's go back to the next question next part uh, it's a or so either you can attempt this one or that one describe the process of amplification of gene of interest using a pcr technique so basically for the pcr the three different steps let's let's talk about these three different steps because it's a three marks so polymerase chain reactions guys polymerase chain reaction basically works in three different steps the first step is denaturation you can you have to explain the step of a denaturation here there is a separation of two strand with the help of a diagram guys you have to explain separation of two strands and always separation requires a high temperature that means around 90 to 95 degree celsius depending on the cg content is being given clear now the second step is annealing is annealing guys what do you mean by annealing annealing means joining of the primer the oligonucleotide primer oligonucleotide primers they yeah, are around 55 degree celsius temperature this also basically guys it depends on uh, the uh, amount of cg content clear now the third one is the extension this step you have to explain basically with the help of a diagram guys you can explain if i start explaining this topic definitely the session will go up to 3 hours so because of the time constraint i have to just so extension means so here the tark polymerase is being used so tark polymerase make a copy of it clear here the temperature is around 75 degree celsius guys overall if i say on an average if we go for if we go for let's say 30 cycle 30 cycles of these three it creates a copy of 1 billion 1 billion copies we can produce of a dna fragment just imagine and it is calculated by 2 raised to the power n form a formula and n here means number of cycles this was also asked in one of the questions so i thought to share with you clear buddies now next question is two children a and b aged 4 to 5 years respectively visited a hospital with a similar genetic disorder a girl a was provided enzyme replacement therapy and was advised to re uh, revisit periodically for with further treatment girl b was however given a therapy that did not require revisit for the further treatment deem the ailment the two girls they were suffering so basically they were suffering from skid right they were suffering from skid severe combined immunodeficiency why did the treatment provide girl a require because multiple visit because she went for the enzyme replacement enzyme was replaced so ultimately these enzyme they were periodically replaced so she has to come again and again because in skid patients guys what happens is one enzyme which is adenosine deaminase is absent when it is not there when it is not functioning properly in that case a b and t lymphocyte they will not be able to mature and proliferate if that will not happen the overall immune system they will be compromised so a person will be immunocompromised so chances of further infection is very high 
वन ऑफ द ट्रीटमेंट इज एंजाइम रिप्लेसमेंट थेरेपी वेर दिस एंजाइम एंजाइम एडिनोसिन डी एमिनेज इज बींग गिवन टू द पेशेंट पीरियोडिकली बिकॉज दैट विल बी हेल्पफुल फॉर द फर्दर फॉर्मेशन ऑफ अ इम्यून सिस्टम यू कैन से periodically it is given it's like a normal insulin injection we are taking now second thing is however for the girl second girl which was given she was given a therapy where she was not supposed to come again and again because the therapy which was given to her that is a gene therapy now again a very different thing in here question says she is already of 5 years she is already of 5 years and that time she is taking this treatment gene therapy at this age definitely it will not work the person has to go again and again in gene therapy a gene of adenosine deaminase is introduced into the wbc now listen guys very carefully wbc they have some life and after some time it has to be replaced again and again so person has to go to hospital again and again so this question it is not perfect or it's not accurate i must say if gene therapy could have given at the time of embryonic stages at that time she was uh, she uh, uh, will not get this disease but here the question says she is having that disorder so which is not possible by the, the by the gene therapy also clear you should understand this this is already there this is directly from the topic of uh, uh, gene therapy from the chapter <coughs> from the chapter human health and diseases now uh No, no, not. Uh, this is from the chapter. Sorry, biotechnology, right? No. How was a girl B was cured per 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 permanently? This is because this can be because gene therapy was done in embryonic stage. So many times, question may come like such type of question can come may come where you are confused. because question seems not right so this can happen but try to be calm at that time because at that time if you are going to shout and if you are going to say that uh, uh, this question is incorrect you are going to shout about the topic do not do that because that is not going to work ultimately teachers will get to know with time they will get to know you can uh, write a mail to them this is how you can communicate and you uh, those who have attempted such type of question they will get some marks with respect to these don't worry about it yes cure is there the problem is there so it can be solved also right so be calm at that time whenever such type of question come where the question seems incorrect to you be calm at that time uh, if you if you have that or option go for that or, or option if you do not have that or option in that case attempt that question and uh, you can write a mail later on clear now let's talk about the long answer type question now explain the one application of each of these the first one is the amniocentesis guys amniocentesis is basically done to detect the chromosomal disorder chromosomal disorders if a person is having any kind of if a uh, baby is having any kind of chromosomal disorder when he or she is there in mother's womb at 18 week the uh, amniotic fluid is being taken out they are being cultured and chromosomal analysis is being done to check whether a person or a baby is carrying that disease or not accordingly the steps can be taken lactational amenorrhea that means in highly lactating women a highly lactating i am repeating up to 6 months no ovulation happened so if no ovulation will happen so chances are it's a natural method of contraception which is not uh you can say a uh, reliable second one is a zift that is a zygote intra fallopian transfer zygote intra fallopian transfer that means guys the zygote up to 8 cell stage they are transferred into the fallopian tube so this is a method of assisted reproductive technology now prepare a poster this question was asked regarding the poster we have to prepare so you guys are more creative than your chavi ma'am definitely you can do such type of questions but for this poster definitely this questions hopefully will not be asked in 2023 examination so do not take any colors do not focus on these things but in case it comes you are create uh, creative persons you are very good artist if in fact i say more than your chavi ma'am 
so clearly you can do clear so let's wind up the session over here we have talked about so many questions guys really sorry for that if i have not talked about many topics in detail because of the time constraint otherwise this could the session could have gone for the 3 to 4 hours if if i have i could have started explaining the pcr pcr itself take 1 hour for me because talking about the pcr who discovered it what are the different applications what are different type of the pcrs we have so many things are there which is related to the pcr which definitely is not possible in this session so uh let's find out the session over here we are going to meet next where i'll be discussing more about uh this uh, these classes which are happening where we are discussing your previous year questions so till then take care have safe in this time till then take care bye guys see you in the next class bye bye everyone